Hello, everybody. So to start out, I would like you all to scroll all the way to the bottom of the stage. There's a link to live closed captions provided by Amanda of White Coat Captioning. She is not an AI, but a professional at helping make things accessible to all. Please click that link to get your live captions, which open in a new window that you can place as needed. Our captions were paid for by our sponsor, CoreLight. We appreciate their commitment to inclusion by covering that expense. We were really hoping to be in Vegas initially, but we think it worked out to be in Hoppin again this year. Hoppin has improved over the past year. So if you were here last year, it still isn't perfect, but it has gotten a bit better. This year, our slogan is Spark a Journey. We hope that over the course of the event, each one of you finds things that spark your interest, your passion, your creativity, and new pathways into and through your information security journey. I want to stress that the Diana Initiative acknowledges everyone is a multidimensional, complex being. For those here, security may be a job, a hobby, or a passion. We're encouraging to light a spark, but I don't want to limit you to just professional stuff. Make a friend in the networking area. Find a new hobby in the hands-on labs. There's lots of options. We encourage all of you to be kind. It has been a really rough year, and who can't do with a little extra kindness? It's important to remember that you all agreed to follow our policies, which do include a code of conduct. If you need to report a conduct that violates our policy or a safety concern, or just you feel uncomfortable, please click on the link in the reception area, tdi.mobi forward slash COC alert, and ask the on-call staffer to DM you. If you can't find the link in the reception area, the URL again is tdi.mobi forward slash COC alert. You can also view it on our website FAQ. If you still can't find it, just reach out to one of the friendly volunteer or staff members hanging out in the chat area and they'll provide you with the link. I want to thank our sponsors. Without them, we could not have afforded this platform, our live captions, and all of the other expenses that go into making a conference happen. This year, our diamond sponsors are INE, eLearn Security, Axonis, and our platinum sponsors are MongoDB, Juniper Networks, and CoreLight, who also donated to cover closed captioning. Our gold sponsors are Google, Bridge Crew, and our rainbow sponsors, who we deeply appreciate y'all, Carnegie Mellon University Information Networking Institute. They're back again if you hit the expo area. Digital Defense Fund, Novetta, Leviathan. Leviathan also paid for our AV person for this stage. Remediant. Verizon, Amazon Information Security, Intel Security, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Microsoft, Secure Code Warrior, and Try Hack Me. Huh, that was a lot, wasn't that? But you all were not here to hear me ramble on about how to use Hopin. What you actually came here to see Alyssa Miller. She's a hacker, researcher, security advocate, and currently the BISO for S&P Global Ratings. She wears many hats, including author, public speaker, barbecue enthusiast, just check her Twitter feed, Fancy Friday fashion host and icon, and a well-known hacker who can clearly explain any complex issues. I cannot express how happy I am that Alyssa accepted our invitation to be the opening keynote and start out our event. 
So without further ado, here's Alyssa. Welcome to Diana Initiative. Uh, and Nicole, thank you so much for the introduction. And oh my God, I am I'm equally thrilled to be here. I'll be mean, getting that invitation to join all of you and to be just to have this opportunity to deliver an opening keynote at an event that has meant so much for me over the years. I, I just this is I, I couldn't be happier. And I, what a great theme for this year's event sparking your journey. So we're going to talk about that today, sparking your security career. You know, so many of us, we sit down and wonder every day, how, how do I get ahead? Where, how do I achieve these goals? When's the right time to go take that leap of faith and go after that next job or that, you know, that exciting new opportunity? Do I, do I take this risk or is that you know, do, do I have the ability to really do what it is I think I want to do? And, you know, it all too often we get held back for one reason or another, right? We, we don't, we're afraid that we're going to get burnt. But the reality is if you're the flame that ignites your career, you can't get burnt. So let's take a step back first. Now I love hiking and a lot of people who love hiking also go camping. So imagine this for a minute. You're going to go on a trip. You're going to go hiking somewhere and you maybe spend some time by a lake doing some camping. And so your, your mind is just filled with these ideas of what it would be like to, you know, camp out on the shores of a small lake, maybe build a big campfire that you can just sit around with your friends, anyone that, you know, whoever it is that you're hiking or camping with. And do the things you do around a fire. Maybe it's making s'mores or sharing stories, whatever. But this is your goal to be in this position, laid out there, just chilling, loving life, enjoying nature on the shores of the lake. So what do you do? Well, of course, you start to make plans. Maybe this is something you've, you've never done before. And so you, you might start just doing some investigation. Like, how, how do we get there? What do I need to take with me? How do I go about getting this campfire built? And so you'll start to read about, well, you're going to need to bring campfire wood because trying to find it in the woods that day might be pretty tough. And, and so you start putting together all these ideas. And before you know it, you've got a plan. You know exactly what you're going to do. You're really excited. And so you start collecting all those things. You're getting wood together. You pack that up to take with you and you're all fired up. But then you start telling your friends about your plans and think about this for a minute. Maybe you start asking other people for their ideas, their thoughts, or how, you know, maybe pointers on how to do it. And then all of a sudden they start filling your head with images like this. Campfires gone wrong. They start telling you about all the things that could happen where someone could get injured in a, you know, a campfire like this one here where two teenagers got severely injured. And, and suddenly they start filling your mind with doubts. Do I, can I really do this? Uh, you know, start thinking about all the things that bad things that could happen. And well, maybe I'm just not ready. I've never done this before. Maybe I should take a smaller step. I, 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 maybe I, this might just not be the right time to do this trip. And suddenly you're second guessing everything. 
you had this great idea. You knew where you wanted to go. You knew exactly how you wanted to get there. You had it all laid out. You built up the skills you needed to make it happen. But still, somehow people got you second guessing. Maybe it was yourself. Maybe you told yourself stories in your head during that research. You came across different horror stories, whatever it was, but somehow you got to that point. This is what happens in our career journeys far too often. We lay out those goals. We know how we want to get there. We research, we study, we develop our skills, we gain experience. And yet when the time comes to take that next leap, we let all of these voices get in our heads and tell us now is not the time. These are the reasons you shouldn't go for that next position. These are the reasons you shouldn't take that leap and start your own business. And we talk ourselves out of it. Sometimes those voices come from outside. Sometimes they're just voices in our own heads. But somehow we hold ourselves back. Cybersecurity is this industry where we have all this opportunity to do so many great things. There's no reason that we can't get out there. And yet, sometimes we just... We don't do it. So let me start by sharing with you a little bit of my perspective, how I got where I am and the stumbles that I encountered along the way that threatened to hold me back. You see, I got started in cybersecurity and in tech before I was even out of college. Okay, I was 19 years old. I had enrolled initially in college as a pre-med major. Despite all the things I had done, buying a computer when I was 12 years old and hacking into online systems, teaching myself programming, all these things, I never really thought that computers were going to be my career path. I thought, no, nah, you know, I'm, I, I was all hell-bent on being a surgeon. So I enrolled in pre-med three semesters into college level chemistry. And I'm like, peace out. I can't do this. This is not for me. I am not going to enjoy this life. I need to go in a different direction. So I scrambled. I had to find a new major. And I looked through the course catalog and I found that they had a computer science degree. And I already knew how to program, like I told you. And so I figured, okay, this will be an easy thing. And I got into that degree major or that particular degree program. Now, this is where serendipity starts to take over in my career path. I was 19. I was still enrolled full-time in school, but it was the dot-com era. We were just learning all the awesome things the internet could do. Things like e-commerce were exploding on the scene. And organizations who wanted to chase down that path were hiring programmers wherever they could find them. And so at 19 years old, I got my first full-time salary job in technology as a programmer for a Fortune 500 financial technologies firm. I was lucky. I got lucky. You know, it, at least that's what I told myself. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. So I sat in that role for nine years and I continued to advance. I was a senior developer. I was the lead, you know, a, a team lead. I was... I did lots of really cool things. I built lots of great, great software. It was a payment processing platform that is still in use today when you make your electronic bill payments to other people or to businesses. Somewhere in there, I'm sure some of the code I wrote, scary enough, is probably still there. But then at 28, I had a manager from the security team reach out to me and ask me if I wanted to join her security test team. Now, she knew me because we had worked on other projects before, and she came to me and talked about it a little bit. And I told her, I said, you know, I don't know anything about penetration testing. And she looked at me and she goes, that's all right. You're smart. You'll figure it out. That's why I asked you. Okay, well, I guess if you're confident it's something new and different, I could try. And I did it. I joined the penetration testing team. Again, kind of serendipitous. It wasn't anything that I laid out in my career plan. And you know what? It turns out I was actually pretty damn good at that. In fact, by the time I was 31, I was leading not only that team, but the entire vulnerability management program for the organization. 
And this wasn't a small organization. In fact, by this point, we had gone through a massive merger. We were now a company of 35,000 people globally. I was managing teams around the globe and I was managing vulnerability management for over 900 applications and tens and tens of thousands of systems. But it never really struck me that like, okay, wow, 31 and I'm, I'm doing this for what was now a Fortune 200 company. I just got lucky. So at 35, I, I had now switched into uh, security consulting. After 15 years of that organization, I wanted to see what the rest of the world was doing. I got into consulting. And at 35, I joined an organization in their application security practice. Now, that practice was the least profitable practice in the entire company. All right. They were struggling mightily. I came in, I didn't, I came in as a managing consultant with no team. The goal was they wanted to expand. And it was my job to build another team. I had two other peers who were managing consultants, had teams of their own. I needed to build mine. So I did that. But more importantly, I worked with my director, our practice director. And you know what we did? We turned that practice around completely. 400% growth in 18 months. We went from the least profitable practice to the most profitable. My team, that team that I built from the ground up, was the single most profitable team in the entire company across all practices. But, you know, I got help from my director. He's the one who really helped me get there and, and see the, you know, where we could maximize our profitability and so forth. So, you know, I mean, how much of that's really on me? Then at 37, that organization went through a massive overhaul. They were acquired by another company. They merged together. I left. I joined a new company as the head of their program services practice. So now I'm leading an entire consulting practice. And that consulting practice, program services, we weren't focused on doing pen tests and you know tactical assessments. I was working with CEOs, CIOs, CISOs of major global organizations, government entities, helping them build application security practices. That's what my consulting practice was all about. And I was head of that practice. I reported into the COO. But I mean, it, just, it was just, again, it was a course of lucky events. And then when I turned 41, I was working for yet another consulting organization and my director left. And when he left, one of the things he did was he recommended me as his successor, not just to the VP who would be the hiring manager to bring in the replacement, but to the executive committee of that organization. And yet, you know what happened? I got passed over. I didn't feel that I was treated fairly. And in that moment, I started to wonder, was I just not ready for that level of role? Was trying to be the director of a billion dollar sales organization, sales and consulting organization, was that just, I wasn't ready to be there yet? And I really started to second guess myself. It really destroyed my self-confidence. Despite everything that I had done up until that point, I didn't feel like I could be worth consideration for a role like that. In fact, I ended up leaving that company because like I said, I didn't feel, and I still today don't feel like I was treated fairly in that process. And I got out of leadership roles altogether. I went to an individual contributor role. I changed my goals completely. Instead of wanting to accelerate up and to one day lead an entire security organization as maybe a CISO, I instead went into this individual contributor role and figured I was going to focus on traveling a lot and my public speaking that I was already doing. And it was while I was in that role that another seemingly serendipitous opportunity happened. One of the big three social media firms had started a, an executive search and that executive search company reached out to me out of the blue and asked me if I was interested in putting my hat in the ring for this position. Now that position never actually happened. They ended up, they didn't create the position they thought they were, they went a different route. That, happens all the time. 
But the fact that I was asked to be a part of that got me thinking. I started looking at my, my LinkedIn profile to see like, how did they get to me? How did they pick me? And I started looking at all of this and I realized something. I did. I always looked at everything I'd done as luck. It was just pure luck. I had help. I got there, you know, just because I worked with awesome people. And finally, as I look back on it and consider how did I end up in that executive search, I realized I've actually done some really incredible things in my career. So I took a chance. I networked. I reached out. I I connected with somebody who I'd been connected with for some time on social media. She was the CISO of S&P Global, a company that I, I knew something about because everybody's heard of probably the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial, or you've heard the, the name Standard & Poor's. That was that company. And she had a position that she was talking about on LinkedIn for a business information security officer. And as I read up on it and I found out what it was, I was excited. This was the chance to direct the security strategy for a multi-billion dollar credit ratings division within S&P Global. She got me connected with the hiring manager. And over the course of that, it ultimately worked out. I got hired to that role. As you heard Nicole mention in her intro, I am now the business information security officer of S&P Global Ratings. Every day I wake up, I hear my company in the news because they're talking about what the S&P 500 is expected to do today. Or they're talking about a credit rating that we released or we upgraded the, uh, the outlook for countries like Australia recently. These are exciting things that my organization does. And to know that I'm leading a multi-billion dollar division's security strategy, that's exciting. This is one huge step closer to my goal of someday being at the head of an enterprise organization's security team as a CISO. This is what happens when you get over all the fears, all the self-confidence issues, and you go for it. You shoot your shot to get that thing that you want. Go for your goals. This is how it works. But there are those things that hold us back and we need to understand them in order to understand how to overcome them. And the reality is, if you're a man in this industry, a lot of these things don't hit you the way that they hit others. So let's start by talking about some of the things that derail women in particular and, and other non-males, non-binary, for instance, as well in our careers things that affect us disproportionately to other demographic groups. So 2020 was particularly hard on women. If you've read some of the studies that have been done over the course of the pandemic and just the stats that they found, the fact that women have disproportionately left the workforce over the course of the pandemic over men. Well, some of that happens, and this I find this mind-numbing as I started to research why this was happening. There's still this belief in society, and it's a prominent belief. It is still the majority, in fact, of people in technology today who believe that for women, work should be secondary. Women are still expected to be the ones in the home, raising children, making the home. And if they can fit in a career too, great, good for them. We'd love to have them. But you know what? At the end of the day, their priority needs to be that home and family life. Men don't get that same expectation. Men are expected to be out there bringing home the bacon, if you will, working in high-level positions in large organizations, making lots of money, supporting their families. There's still this bias from years and years and years ago of women's places in the home first, if they want a career and they can make all that work, great, but they're the ones responsible. This still occurs today, and I found study after study that talked about this, surveys that showed this in results. This is what we as women have to overcome. It's not easy because it is such a predominant attitude even today. 
And as a result of this, if you're a male, you're expected to overwork. If you're anybody in technology, value is placed on overwork, putting in 50, 60, 80 hours. And as you climb the ladder, those expectations grow. Let me tell you, I experienced it firsthand and I have to, I have to build those boundaries. But the reality is because of the focus on women being homemakers first and career people second, we're expected to put in even additional levels of overwork in order to overcome, in order to establish our value to the organization. And the only way for us to stand out is to do that. That's the expectation that's hoisted upon us. But employers want to fix this, right? Employers want to be better. They want to be more welcoming to women. So they create all of these, you know, women focused uh, initiatives and benefits and things. But unfortunately, these have unintended impacts because they end up creating off ramps, excuses for women to get out of the workforce. Think of maternity leave, for instance, as organizations have implemented maternity leave beyond just the legal requirements, but putting long runways out there for women to be home with their children, how far behind are many organizations in that they don't offer the same level of paternity leave? So if you want to argue that that first point isn't true, go no further than that spot there. Women are the ones expected to be home. Yes, there's a medical piece to that as well. But shouldn't the men be home, able to be home with their wives when if they are recovering from a medical thing? The fact of the matter is, the way that these programs get set up, they create off ramps that make it easy for women to take a detour and get out of their careers. It's not intentional. It's not, it's not something that has you know any type of malicious focus, but it happens. And as a result, we have this lack of representation. And I cannot tell you, I, I can't express it in words. When you can't see the people that look like you in those higher levels that you aspire to, it matters for women, for non-binary individuals, for the LGBT, for black women and men who don't see themselves reflected at those higher levels. Those lack of role models can be very discouraging. When you walk into that executive committee meeting or you walk into that board meeting and you're the only woman or the only black person or the only Mexican person or the only Latino or whatever group you want to you, you want to cite that you may identify with that impacts you and it discourages you from wanting to go further it hurts your self confidence because you feel like you don't belong and this is something that we're forced to have to overcome but that's not the only thing I know we talk about this a lot in security. In fact, I know there's a talk coming up later today about imposter syndrome and how to overcome imposter syndrome. You see, a lot of what I told you about in my own path was imposter syndrome. That idea that, well, you know, I got lucky. Well, I had help to get to those impressive things that I did. Let me tell you now, everyone gets lucky and everyone gets help along the way. It's what you do when you get those opportunities. It's how you leverage those lucky breaks. It's how you work with those people who can help you that makes your success happen. And everybody that has been successful has had to go through that. And by success, I mean achieving your goals. You don't get there by yourself. But the problem is, and maybe you've seen this diagram before. I wish I knew the origins. I've seen it in a number of books. I don't, I can't credit the person who originally did it because I don't know who they are. But we have this idea as we talk in cybersecurity and we see a bunch of people talking about different topics. We assume that they know everything because we see all these different voices talking about different aspects of cybersecurity that we don't know. So we just, we lump all that together and give them credit for some level of collective knowledge. They know all the things. Well, I only know this much. And this leads to that feeling that 
you know what? One of these days I'm going to get exposed as a fraud. Somebody's going to ask me a question about something that I don't know about, something that's in this big pink circle, not a part of my little green circle there. And it, it holds us back. It, it causes us to fear going for that next big step, that next big opportunity. But the reality is this is what people's knowledge looks like. Everybody has their own specialized area. There is so much to know when we talk about cybersecurity. We can't any one of us ever possibly know all of it. I think about voices that I see in the media, like Katie Messiers or you know Dave Kennedy or Ian Coldwater, all these amazing individuals who are doing awesome things and many times things that I don't know anything about. I see people like Leslie Carhart giving amazing talks on ICS security and I'm blown away because I know almost nothing about ICS. But what I've learned is that there are things that I know that Leslie and Dave and Katie, they would love to know more about what I know. Sometimes they've asked me. That's the reality. Every one of us has those areas of this knowledge base that we're interested in and we dig into, but we don't know it all. None of us do. Every one of us has that area of knowledge that we have that's special and unique to us and it overlaps with others, but nobody's got it all on lockdown. And understanding how to see that and acknowledging that and acknowledging that the knowledge you have is every bit as important. Even if you know nothing about cybersecurity at all, you still bring valuable perspectives and knowledge from whatever experiences you've had before into this space. Cybersecurity isn't just an industry anymore. Cybersecurity is about defending our very way of life. Digital technology is ingrained in everything we do. The people issues that we have to deal with require people solutions. That's why social engineering has blown up so much in the last few years. All of the perspectives you might bring from any other job role, whether you worked in retail or as a barista at Starbucks, you can bring all of that to bear and that has value in cybersecurity. So it's important for you to recognize that and own that and learn how to leverage that to your advantage. Now, speaking of job searching, I mentioned going from pivoting out of retail and or you know a, a service job like being a barista into cybersecurity. The problem is those job hunts can be tough too, can't they? And part of the reason is that job descriptions suck. Nicole mentioned I'm I'm an author. I'm currently authoring a book on beginning your career in cybersecurity. As part of that, I did a lot of research. I researched job descriptions. I interviewed recruiters, hundreds of them. And I found some interesting things. Job descriptions are awful. They look like this. Look at this. This is a three-page job description. We just made it bigger for you, and I'm sure most of you still can't even read this text. Now, this is a high-level position. It's information security architect. But look at this laundry list of requirements and technologies and responsibilities. Where are they ever going to find a unicorn who matches up to this? They won't. But if you, like me, have read studies on this, you know that they've found that men are better suited to applying to roles like this simply because they're, they're more willing to take that leap. In other words, what they found is that men will look at this list of bullet points and, and if they meet about 25 to 30% of it, they feel qualified and they'll apply. For others, we look at it and we're like, eh, you know, 70 to 80% we expect to be able to tick off all those boxes before we're feeling comfortable to apply. It's not that the men are any more skilled than anyone else. That's just the mindset they have. Now, we could argue for days on where that mindset comes from. That's not important. What is important is as you look at job descriptions like this, understand that they're trash. Understand that this is garbage. And then move on from it. Read 
the description of the role itself. You see it here. Information security architect plays an integral role in defining and assessing the organization's security strategy, architecture, and practices. Focus on that line. Does that sound like something you can do? Do you feel like you could learn on the dry on the job and make that happen? Then forget all these bullet points and apply. Now, Stephanie is going to talk tomorrow in her keynote more about how to hack your job search and how to take a very different approach to interviews and everything else. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today, but I encourage you to check out that keynote tomorrow morning because she's going to arm you with some really valuable tools in this regard as well. But what you need to be focused on here is how do the skills that you do have, the experiences you do have, even if they come from working at Starbucks, nothing to do with cybersecurity at all. And I realize it sounds like I'm picking on Starbucks. I'm not. My point is, if you don't have cybersecurity experience, you still bring valuable pieces to job descriptions like this. Understand how you can identify those core skills that transcend industries that you have and apply them to the role and sell yourself in that best light. Now, one of the biggest areas where we stumble in our job search is knowing our own worth. I just coached somebody through a job search recently. And in her job search, she asked me multiple times. She was worried about her current salary and what her salary goals were. She was worried that because, you know, in the past she hadn't made the level of salary that she was asking for in these new roles, that that was going to be a problem. When you apply for a job and you get a job offer, you don't get paid based on the salary you have now or the salary you had previously, you need to be getting paid for the job you're going to do in that role. This is an important distinction. Many states now, employers aren't even legally allowed to ask you about your current compensation. There's a good reason for that. Because your salary that they offer you should not be dependent on what your current salary is. It should be based on what their salary range is for that job and where you fit in terms of qualification so they can place you within that range, period. End of story. As somebody who has hired countless individuals, I can tell you that's how it works at the end of the day. We look at that. Whenever I've looked at hiring somebody, it's never been about what do they make now. It's about how well qualified are they for this position? Where do they fall in that spectrum? And then I'm going to place the salary offer that I make in that range that I have for that position, commensurate with how well they fill the role. This means you need to get out and do research. Use your network to discover what somebody in a senior security architect role makes. Use LinkedIn, Indeed, Glassdoor. They all share some level of salary information. Now, it may not always be accurate, but more often than not, it'll give you some idea. I can tell you personally, in my role that I'm in now as a BSO, this is something I did. And when I got into that job and we started talking about salary, I already knew what their range was before the HR person told me so. He basically confirmed for me that I was right. And I had found that information on Glassdoor in my case. Now, if you're not comfortable talking about you know, what salary expectations you have, it is okay to turn that around on the recruiter and specifically ask them, well, what is your range? The recruiters I talked to said they're happily share that information. Most organizations have no problem. If you ask, they will tell you what that range is. They don't always offer it up. They do still sometimes try to guard that information a little bit, but we're moving away from that. And you can help that motion by not being afraid to ask, hey, what are you willing to pay? Or at least go in there and have an idea of what you want to ask for. People get afraid to ask for too much. They're afraid that, well, if I go in and I say this is my salary demand, they're just going to end the interview right there. No, they're not. They're going to come back and tell you, well, this is the maximum that we can pay for that. And then you're going to let them know whether or not that would be enough to get you to come in. And the reality is they expect that. They're not going to look down on you for that. So don't be afraid to have those conversations. They are crucial. And the reality is, 
Think about this for a minute. If they weren't willing to share that information with you, if they were going to be so guarded about that, that they were going to keep it a secret from you, consider if that's a company you would really want to be working for anyway. If they're going to shut down an interview because you asked for a number that was too high without even trying to talk to you more about it, is that the kind of company you want to work at? Think about that. But what about this idea of mentorship? Mentorship is so important. How do we establish these connections with others? We hear about mentorship all the time. We hear women in particular being encouraged to find mentors. We hear, you know, I've, I've seen it in LGBT spaces where we get encouraged to find mentors because we don't have the opportunity to see ourselves represented at high levels oftentimes. But a lot of the time when we talk about mentoring, unfortunately, what people talk about is leveraging mentoring relationships to learn job skills or to get career coaching. And that's all good. That's all necessary. But we need more than that. Mentoring needs to be about more than just learning skills. It needs to be about learning about your mentor personally. That is the value of having a mentor. You want to learn about what struggles and triumphs they had, how they got there. Rin Oliver, in their closing keynote tomorrow, is going to talk about how you break through after you've had a setback. Their talk is about rising from the ashes. Check that out tomorrow. Stick around. Make sure you don't miss that final keynote. Because everybody goes through that. And learning how others have dealt with it will, will not only equip you with valuable knowledge about how to rise from those ashes, as Rin's going to talk about, but it'll also help you see that everybody goes through those same struggles. So when you stumble, it's okay. It's part of the process. Now, the other thing your mentor can do for you, as you establish a really good working relationship and your mentor sees what you're capable of and understands what your career goals are, and you develop that rapport, your mentor becomes part of your network. I mentioned before how I leveraged my network to find my current role. That is something you want. You need those allies out there helping. And it's not just that you reach out to them when you're, you're looking at a job or something, but imagine they understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish and what you're capable of. They may hear of a position that you haven't heard of yet, and they could actually bring that to you. That is what you're looking for in your mentorship relationships. It's not just career or skills coaching. It is so much bigger than that. And mentoring relationships don't have to be these big formal relationships. Sometimes they are. Sometimes you'll reach out to somebody and ask them to be your mentor. You'll set up a regular cadence on which you get together and you talk about things. Honestly, from my personal experience, the best mentoring relationships I have have grown organically. Just people I worked with or I met professionally or in some other aspect. And we just kind of became friendly, maybe not friends per se, but we developed a relationship at a professional level. And soon that trust grew and I was able to ask them sensitive questions. I was able to learn from them. I was able to see how their career journey developed. I was able to talk with them about situations I was experiencing. That's what mentorship should be about. Recognize when those relationships come your way. Grasp onto them. Use them to your advantage. And be willing to give back as well in those relationships. Sometimes your mentors can learn from you too. Any good mentor realizes that. They have so many lessons to learn from you because your perspectives are different than theirs. You're coming to this world from a very different background than theirs. So be willing to provide that value back as well. Now let's talk more about that job search. I mentioned before, Stephanie has a great talk in her keynote tomorrow on really approaching the whole interview process differently. So be sure to get up early again tomorrow and check that out. But it is important that in that job search, we start to think about those denials differently. We've all gotten them, right? Everybody gets them. I have. Every job search I've ever gone through, 
I've gotten denials, multiple denials oftentimes before I found that job that gave me an offer and an offer that I accepted. It happens. That is part of the process. And probably the biggest struggle here is understanding that it's not personal. You're interviewing them. They're interviewing you all at the same time. You're trying to figure out if they're a good fit for you. They're trying to figure out if you're a good fit for them. And if they come back and they ultimately determine that someone else was a better fit, they're not telling you that you're not valuable, that you wouldn't be a good fit in their role. It's just maybe that somebody else was a better fit. And that can be for lots of reasons. It could be that they had just one special skill that you didn't have that was particularly important for that job. Or maybe it is that they just happened to have the right network that they were already connected with someone on the inside. Sometimes that happens too. Maybe they were an internal candidate, which immediately makes it easier for an employer to go that direction because it's a known quantity. It's less risk for them. Just understand it's not a personal statement on you or your skills or your personality or anything else. These denials are an opportunity to learn more about yourself and to learn where you can get better. Get feedback when you get those denials. It is 100% perfectly valid to ask that recruiter when they send you a message saying that they've decided to go in a different direction. You can come back and ask them, would you be willing to share with me what I could do or how I could develop more that would have made me a better fit for this job? Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. Indeed, there are unfortunately some organizations out there in the tech space who actively announce that they won't provide that type of feedback. In my opinion, that's a huge mistake, mistake and I think it's actually a pretty toxic way to relate with the workforce. But I can't argue with them. They're big, successful companies, and that's what they do. Maybe they've got a perspective on that I don't have. But the reality is most organizations will have those conversations, will share that feedback with you if you just ask for it. Now, I don't like to look at denials as failure. I hate that idea, right? We use failure a lot. But if we're going to talk about them as failures, let me take a little cliche here and throw it at you. Failure is part of learning. In fact, failure is how you learn. If you set a goal out there and you just immediately attain it, you don't grow, you don't develop, you didn't learn anything through that process. It's when we don't achieve a goal. It's when we have those setbacks. It's when we get those denials that now we've got an opportunity to learn and grow and that's how we get better. So look at your job search that way. Go in with the expectation that you are going to get denied. Even that job that you are so excited about, it seems like such a perfect fit and you're so confident you're going to get it. I know it hurts when they come back with that rejection letter. I've been there. We've all been there. It's tough. Process those feelings. They're valid. But then come back to it. And try to sit with that and look at it objectively and see how it can be a force for good. See how that can be something that's going to move you to the next level. Appreciate the fact that it's a risky thing when you're trying to hire somebody and they're trying to do their best job. And if they didn't think you were a fit, maybe you weren't. And the last thing you want to do is land in a job where you're not a good fit. And maybe they were wrong. Maybe you would have been the the absolute best person for that role. Maybe they made a mistake. Again, try not to take that as a personal affront to you. Just understand that the whole process of hiring is so imperfect and so fraught with risk. We all do our best. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. So keep working, keep developing, and you know what's going to happen? Eventually, you're going to get that job offer. All right, so the company came back to you. They gave you that job offer. You open the, that email, you look at the, maybe they sent it in a PDF and it's not the salary you wanted. You were hoping for more. They didn't give you the variable compensation, the bonus program that you were looking for. Maybe you, you didn't get the number of weeks of vacation that you were hoping to get for that level of role. 
Does that mean you're out of it? Does that mean you just have to accept what they've put on paper or walk away? 100% emphatically, no. That is not what that means. That is not at all what that means. I mentioned interviewing hundreds of recruiters. You know what? Every one of them expects you to come back with a negotiation. And it's not just about salary. Okay? You can negotiate the variable compensation package. You can negotiate the number of vacation days that they're going to give you. What you need to understand is what's most important to you and are there things that can offset. So for instance, if they come back to you with a salary that isn't what you were expecting or isn't what you were hoping for and you ask for more, they might come back and say, well, you know what? That's the top of our range. We can't go any higher. Maybe they can give you a signing bonus. Maybe they can give you more vacation time. Are you willing to accept those things? The fact of the matter is, When you go into this, don't be afraid to negotiate. I talk to people who are afraid to negotiate because they're worried that the company is going to rescind the job offer if they do. Now, if you come back and you ask for double what they've offered, yeah, they're probably going to pretty much be ready to walk away. But if that's really what you were hoping to get paid for that role, if they offered you one hundred and fifty thousand, you said no. I want three hundred thousand, and you feel the role is worth that. Well, then, do you really want to go in there at one hundred fifty thousand anyway? Probably not. You're never going to be happy in that role. You're going to feel consistently underpaid. So that's okay. But the fact of the matter is, again, they expect you to negotiate. They're not going to walk away simply because you asked for more money. They're not going to rescind that job offer, sir, or that job offer. Excuse me. And I'll say it again: if they do. Is that a company you want to work for? Do you want to work for a company who has such a toxic relationship with their employees that they won't even negotiate job offers? I don't know about you, but me, that's that's a non-starter right there. That's a huge red flag. That is a company that can go find somebody else. I don't need to be a part of that, and neither do you. There are anywhere from 500,000 to 4 million open cybersecurity jobs out there, depending on whose numbers you believe. You'll find a job with a good organization. You don't have to accept that type of treatment. But most of them aren't gonna pull the job offer. You can talk to them. Now understand, there are things that you likely can't negotiate. Like if they're really, really strict on vacation, they might come back and tell you that, you know, look, we have a really strict vacation policy. This is what it is. We're not able to to adjust that. Then maybe you go after something else. If you're not happy with the insurance policies that they have available, probably not a lot they can do about that. Those get set at a high corporate level. They get set once a year. They can't really change those because one person has an issue. Now, they might change it over time. They might make an offer to do that, decide whether that's of value to you or not. But maybe they can give you something else instead. My personal story on this, I went into an organization I wasn't happy with specific procedures that their particular insurance policy didn't cover. And they threw a nice big signing bonus at me. Said, hey, you know what? We realize that we're going to try to fix that insurance, but in the meantime, we're going to add on this extra amount to make up for where you might have medical expenses that won't be covered. That works. That might work for you. That's another decision-making factor. But the point is, it's a negotiation give and take. You may not get everything that you ask for, but you can get more than what they put in their initial offer on that letter. So don't be afraid to ask for it. Go for it. Get paid. Finally, I'm going to use that cliche. Maybe you're familiar with it. Rising tides raise all ships. Sushi is going to talk about this later today in her closing keynote today. She's going to talk about leaders needing to lower the ladders to lift others up. This is part of building your career as well. Being willing to help others, to reach out a hand, to help them grow, helps you grow. I already mentioned the value that a mentee can have to the mentor. Helping people raises your spirits, makes you a better person just in general which helps you 
grow and do your job. It also, other people see that and they want to be a part of the good things that you're doing. And so it helps you that way. Now, yes, there are those in our industry who, for some reason, believe that the only way to prop up their insecure egos is to try to hold others down. That doesn't work. We all sink when we do that. Lift people up. Help them to grow. Again, check out Sushi's late, uh, talk later today on this. My personal experience with this just happened the other day. You see here on the left a tweet that I was in the middle of writing. In fact, this is exactly how my screen looked when FedEx rang my doorbell. I was in a bad space. I was really feeling awful about myself. A lot of reasons I'm not gonna get into. It was a vague tweet. I was vague booking, if you will, on purpose. But I was feeling down and I needed to express it. I needed to get it off my chest and this is how I was feeling. But before I hit tweet, FedEx showed up. I came to my door with a box and it was a box I wasn't expecting. I had no shipments that I knew of that were coming. When I opened up that box, inside were 20 handwritten and in some cases hand drawn thank you notes. These thank you notes came from young middle school aged girls who were involved in a cybersecurity camp called CyberHer. They were on a team that the organizers of CyberHer had asked if they could name after me. Apparently they pick individuals from the cybersecurity community and name their teams after them. And this year they asked me to do, to be one of those team names. It required very, very, very little on my part. I had to write a bit of a bio for them, which they shared with the girls who were on these teams, that was it. But just that little bit resulted in these 20 thank you notes in which many of these girls wrote paragraphs about how inspiring they found my story or about their passion for technology or how hearing my story had changed their mind and they really wanted to get into STEM careers. And suddenly I was uplifted. I was energized. I wanted to do more. I wanted to go running right out and just be the best Alyssa I could be. Just that little gesture of these thank you notes. These are the kinds of things that happen to you when you help raise others up. To realize I've had that much impact on others, what that does for my own self-confidence. 20 girls who in some way were impacted by my life story, who are more energized to chase their careers and their goals as a result. So be willing as your career grows to recognize the value of helping others. Check out that talk, that closing keynote later today. Learn more about strategies for how to do this and the effectiveness of it. Learn from Sushi's research that she has done. Check that out. We're getting down to that time where I'm about to wrap up. But I want to leave you with this quote I felt was fairly apropos to this entire topic. And it comes from our former president. The real test is not whether you avoid failure. Because you won't. Failures are going to happen. You're going to experience them. It's whether you let it harden or shame you into inaction. Do you let it scare you and keep you from going from the things you want? Or do you learn from it? Do you chase that dream? Do you go after it? Do you make yourself the spark that ignites the flames of your career? When you do that, you won't get burned. You can't get burned. You're the flame that's driving that. Own your career journey recognize the wonderful things that you've done. Look objectively at your accomplishments. Don't minimize them. Understand that everybody experiences imposter syndrome. Understand that everybody has had lucky breaks. Take advantage of those and demand better. Get paid for the job that you're going to do and negotiate it. Get the money. Apply to that job, even if the laundry list of 
requirements and responsibilities looks daunting. You can do it. You can get there. Bring your value and sell yourself. Now, I encourage you all to reach out and continue the conversation. I am happy to to discuss anything really with you in terms of cybersecurity or barbecue, like Nicole mentioned, whatever. Reach out to me. Here's my social media information. I'm here to be a resource for you. That's what motivates me these days. And then finally, great, big, massive thank you to Diana Initiative for allowing me the opportunity to be here with you today. Huge thank you to S&P Global Ratings, not only for the opportunity to have this role, but for the opportunity to be here. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have this story to share. If it wasn't for them giving me the time today to share it with all of you, I couldn't be here. But most importantly, thank you. Every single one of you who is here this morning, who's come here to hear about this talk, who has come to Diane and Initiative to, to learn, to grow, to hear from others. Coming up next, we have an amazing panel of cybersecurity leaders in the CISO panel. Stick around for them. Get out to hallway con and interact with others. Build that network, grow, learn. You've got a wonderful two-day opportunity here. Leverage that. But thank you again so much for being a part of this event. I love you all. And thank you very much. You definitely brought people to tears at the end if you uh, check the comments there. And in oh. fact, like there's a whole bunch of people who now are like inspired to try for more job positions, to give a try for negotiating. People were talking about how they couldn't wait to talk about parental leave and how annoying it is to look for those unicorn job postings. So uh, yeah, you definitely hit a home run. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you agreed to open us up. Well, thank you. I'm, 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 my, my heart is exploding right now hearing that. And I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I can't, I can't say enough again, how much it meant to me to be able to share this this year. So thank you. And I'm now going to do the boring bits. So, all right, folks, we have a whole bunch of stuff on Hopin that I am going to tell you about so you can get ready for our next item, which is the panel that Alyssa mentioned. Um, I posted a chat item uh, pinned to the top there. That's a survey for the keynote. So feel free to take that. And so right now you might be using the mobile app. If you are using a mobile device and not using the mobile app, please download that. Uh, things will be ranged slightly differently than in the web browser, but you should still be able to find all the same items. The reception area has a whole bunch of text. I promise you that it's all useful. Give it a good scroll. It's got how to report safety concerns, FAQ, where the swag store is, and at the bottom is our schedule. Clicking on the schedule will bring you to the correct spot in Hopin, so you won't have to navigate around. There's four stages. Stage one, here, where all the keynotes happen, full days of talks. We've also got the live captions provided by Amanda at White Coat Captioning. She's not AI. Our sponsor, Corelight, paid for it, and the link is below the stage. Stage two and three are full days of talks, except for during the keynotes. They don't have live captions, but you can use a web tool called Web Captioner to generate captions if you need those. And that is AI, so it's not going to be perfect. Stage four is Career Village. There are uh, sporadic talks. Go check out the schedule for when those are going to be occurring. Now, in the sessions, that's where our villages are. This year, we have the information booth. Questions? Head there. They will find you the answer. There's Career Village. Mock interviews, resume reviews, LinkedIn reviews, impromptu career advice and chats that just happened. Uh, that was really fun last year. Everyone enjoyed it. Capture the flag. There are four separate CTFs. There's also a DJ, so make sure you stop in there. Internet of Things, hands-on lab, no experience needed. Give it a try. Teen Village, if you are a teenager and you got a teen ticket, you can go in there. Amazing amounts of talks happening there. I'm kind of jelly, actually. Uh, and they're going to get started on their InfoSec journey. Hopefully, they all watch the keynote. 
Maker Village is uh, soldering some desk toys this year, Supernatural 6. Even if you didn't get the kit, you can certainly stop in, learn about surface mount soldering and all sorts of other cool stuff that always happens in there. We have also got Mental Health Hackers Village. They've got uh, some meditations, different talks going throughout the day. There's probably gonna be some videos popping in there with some animals. Might as well swing in if you've got some time. Now, if you have pre-registered for a lock picking workshop, that's gonna be in Zoom and not hop in. So look for that in your email boxes. The little networking icon is a random pairing. So you're gonna to get to talk to somebody else for 10 minutes. I may update it to 15 to be determined. Uh, this is also where the Saturday socials are happening. We have one before the talks and one after the talks to accommodate all the time zones. Finally, our expo hall has sponsors, community organizations, and not-for-profits that we love. So between the talks, like right now, when you've got some time, make sure you grab some swag, CTF, raffle items in the expo hall, Go try out the IoT lab. You could win some raffles all over the place. And I think there's a whole bunch of YubiKeys at the YubiKey booth. Check the schedule for when live things are happening. There's job AMAs at the Google booth. And there's, uh, I think, some other like live demos going on over there. And finally, on the right-hand side, just note there's two different chats. There's going to be the event chat, which is like the general room in Slack or the place you land when you get into Discord. And then there's the chat that's specific to the stage or the session. Make sure you're putting it in the right place. Otherwise, people might be a little bit confused what you're talking about. Uh, and if you do comment in the correct place, the speakers actually get to see it in the backstage here. And with that, you've got probably about 20 minutes to go try out the networking tool, check out the expo hall, or uh, maybe go see who else is around that you know? Thanks, everyone.